we're gonna find out who I really am. I know I'm just... Uh, I am a dark matter being in a trench coat. <laughs> I'll never figure that out there, silly. <laughs> What's that? They're watching right now? Well, I mean, I guess I could throw them into a black hole or something like that. Uh, but they're really watching right now? Uh oh. Uh oh. Okay, I love you too. Don't, don't worry about that. Nothing was happening. Hello and welcome to Office Hours, a live version of the facility where good old Professor Kyle and his fabulous hair opens up his blast doors, as you just saw, and he lets uh, all of my professors, all of my facility staff members, all you members of the general public that didn't heed the warning sign enter the facility so we can go through a number of topics this week, take all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and hopefully learn something today. As we're wont to do, We'll be going through a number of topics uh, throughout the week that made me go, hey, how well. We'll be talking about black hole magnetics, uh, crabs, and how it f and how crabs might be able to program. Yeah, we'll also be ta uh, taking one of your comments from the latest episode of the facility, which is doing very well, which I enjoy. Uh... And we'll t be talking a little bit about the Suez Canal. But before we get to that, I want to let you know that if you want to continue on this conversation after we are done talking live, you can go to Patreon, oh, patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and join the facility today as my security team is putting into the chat right now. And don't provoke the security team. They're both made of beef and have buckets and wrenches. So don't spam, don't all caps, don't be weird, because I'm going to try my very best to get to as many comments in between the segments as I possibly can. And if you really, 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 really want me to see something, you can try Super Chat on YouTube. And that's a way for you to donate to the facility, to Simp for Science, and I'll do my best to read all of those. But if I don't get to everything, I'm sorry. There's nothing more I can do. Stephanie Assenland, with the $50 donation already before the stream even started, said, Hey Kyle, love your work, especially the Half-Life histories. Thank you so much. For your science fiction game streams, which are coming up in May, that I'll be doing uh, with the release of the new Mass Effect game, I couldn't, I can't suggest Alpha Centauri enough and would be fascinated by your impression of some of the hypo hypothetical technology therein. Well, I'll definitely look into that. Eric Castro with the $10 says, My sister wonders why the moon looks like it's following us when we drive. Also, she doesn't believe that we landed on the moon. Convince her otherwise, please. Thanks, Kyle. Show love the... Well, uh, your sister, if she wanted to prove to herself that we landed on the moon, there's one very, very sciencey way that you could do that. And uh, uh, this would require going somewhere and having a lot of resources, but you can also look up videos of this. So we know you can prove to yourself that we landed on the moon because we left stuff on the moon behind after we went there. So astronomers using very powerful lasers can fire lasers at the moon and hit these so-called retro reflectors. These are reflectors that reflect light back in the same direction that it came in. So instead of scattering off in some weird direction, it goes right back. So when we fire these lasers at the retro reflectors on the moon, we actually get some photons back, indicating that we're hitting stuff on the moon that we left there when we went there. And you can look up uh, videos of that kind of stuff, too, if you really want to show your sister. We have a 20 from Arl Liftum. says, I've been, I have a bit of an obsession with pi, although cherry is is superior. <laughs> Fight me. I theorize that the true answer to pi is that it's the absolute epicenter of a sphere. Could also be the answer to wormholes. Thoughts? You should talk to a mathematician. See, there's uh, the problem with your intuition about something that's very, very complicated and usually takes people their entire life to study is that you don't know when you're wrong. You don't know the boundaries of your information. You don't know what you don't know. Right. And what P getting a Ph.D. or doing further study in, in school or college or university really does is help you map out your island of ignorance to see how big it actually is. You might be missing something. And so to suggest a true answer to pi that would win you the Nobel Prize in mathematics and would, you know, uh, win a bunch of awards and write all these papers and stuff to just think of that off the top of your head. The chances of that being correct um, is very, very low, obviously. So, um, I would say look into it and study it more if you really want to. 
Okay, so before we get to our first topic, which is about black holes, we got to get to this one. A 500 euro donation from Z1RVONR. I don't know how to pronounce it, so I apologize. But a 500, I am once again asking you to simp for science. I wanted to ask this last time when you talked about deep fakes, but I missed my chance. Would the expanding use of it cause issues in court and video evidence making it hard to prove guilt or innocence? Yeah. So let's pause the super chats for a second so we can get into our black hole topic. But uh, with that, with that huge donation, I just want to say, uh, answer your question quickly. Yes. So, like I said before, the problem with deepfake technology right now is we don't have the counteracting technology yet. We are kind of always on the back foot with these kind of advancements, right? The the technology to create really good indistinguishable deepfakes is always going to uh, advance faster than the, than the technology trying to identify them. It's kind of like the problem of fact checking versus um, fake news. Fake news and misinformation tends to spread much, much, much faster than fact check information, fact checking um, that false information. So, uh, what I'm getting to is that we will very rapidly find ourselves in a situation with deepfakes where we will have something so problematic and we will not have a good check or balance for it. We will not have a digital fingerprint for it. And I mean, you saw just a couple of weeks ago where a woman was arrested because she deepfaked some of her, uh, some of her daughter's bullies into very compromising positions um, and situations. And if you cannot, by your eye or even digitally, determine whether or not something is authentic, then the entire standard of video, audio, picture, evidence, that's going to have to be retooled completely. And so it, it could end up being a huge problem where you could not say that it wasn't me doing that in that video. Incredibly, incredibly problematic. Um, so yeah, I, th I think... We need to figure that out, and soon, especially before it comes, before it becomes smartphone apps that everyone can have. And before we jump back in, Elizabeth Calvert with the 50 says, Oh my god, sorry I'm late in dealing with a drain under my sink falling apart. My tiny human Alex wants to know how the color changing cars work, i.e. changes color in hot or cold water back to fix fixing the sink. Um, this is just a, a reaction with the heat. Heat is just particles moving around. And so when you have a paint that has certain particles in it, moving those particles around more, heating them up, will change their shape in that paint, right? Something moving is different than something not moving. And when something has a different shape, the way light bounces off of it can change too, Alex. And so if the light bouncing off of something is changing, then the color, which is light, bouncing off of stuff might also change. And speaking of seeing weird, cool light things, let's get to our first topic. Black holes. This is an image, our first image of the shadow of a black hole. You can't really image a black hole because as we just alluded to, light does not reflect off of it. It just falls down into it or orbits around it or passes and warps around it. So this is a shadow of a black hole. It's not the thing itself because you can never see the thing itself. But a couple of months ago, we saw the first this first ever image and it looked absolutely amazing. You can see the accretion disk. This is hot gas and dust swirling down into the maw of the black hole, heating up as it does so, smashing into itself, releasing a bunch of energy. And that's all very cool. But uh, last week, or earlier this week, this image was released, which seems to be an update of this first image. I will say, as some of you pointed out in the comments, that this is not what you would actually quote unquote see. This is a superimposed image of light interacting with magnetic fields. So one big question that astrophysicists have had for a long time is why <laughs> is why do black holes sometimes spew out giant beams of gas and dust and energy from their poles that and and these beams can travel close to the speed of light and be many thousands of light years across um these streaming jets can be you know 
bigger than or longer, wider than the galaxy themselves that the supermassive black hole resides in. How do these form? Well, the scientists still don't know how these form, but they're getting better ideas and they're getting more information. One of their ideas is that magnetic fields had something to do with it. When you have stuff that's rotating, when you have gas, uh, ions, things that are charged and moving, you have electrical fields, you have magnetic fields. And now we have this image superimposed again, not a real image, but superimposed on this black hole, which shows interacting magnetic fields. How? Well, when light and other material interacts with a magnetic field, it can be changed. It can be um, warped and shaped in a certain way. And we call this shaping polarization. You may have heard the same thing. Do I have any sunglasses around here? No. You may have heard, heard the same thing with sunglasses. So sunglasses, when they're polarized, it means they only let a certain direction of light in. So if the light coming through your windshield into your face is all jumbled up in all different directions and there's some glare and stuff like that, then if you have polarized sunglasses that say look like, you know, tiny little blinds that only let a certain kind of light shape of light in, then all this other weird light trying to get into your face doesn't get in and only the nice orderly light gets in and that orderly light can block out a lot of glare and stuff like that. That's how polarization works. So similarly, what astronomers have just recently seen is polarized light coming from this M87 black hole 50 million, 55 million light years away. The light is interacting with uh, magnetic fields around the black hole, getting polarized, getting oriented in a certain direction, and then making it out to our telescopes or our uh, virtual telescope because the telescope isn't one telescope, it's three telescopes all pointed at the same thing from different parts of the planet, making like an Earth-sized telescope, and it's really cool. But what does this weird superimposed image tells us, tell us? Well, it tells us, for one, that there are strong magnetic fields right outside. Well, I mean, this black hole is absolutely massive, but outside the black hole. Now, this means that... This disk, this accretion disk of material falling into the black hole, it contains highly magnetized gas because that's what's polarizing the light. And in their new papers, uh, astronomers are now estimating that this magnetic field strength is between 1 and 30 gauss. That's about 2 to 50 times the strength of Earth's magnetic field. Now, if you were to ask me how strong would a magnetic field be outside of a black hole, it'd probably be pretty crazy. But it turns out it's only 50 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field, which itself is very small. Now, where this ties back into the jets of material that we're trying to figure out blasting into space away from these black holes is that scientists thought that magnetic fields might be involved, and now we have evidence of some magnetic field interaction happening around the black hole, and it's strong enough, the researchers speculate, that it actually prevents some of the material falling down into the black hole from falling into the black hole. It's pushing some of it back away. Most of it falls inside, never to be seen again, but some of it is being pushed out. And Using that new information, I'm quoting here, um, researchers calculate that the M87's black hole is now eating material at a rate of 0.2% of a solar mass per year. Now, again, if you asked me how much stuff a black hole eats in a year, it wouldn't be less than a quarter of a percent of the sun's mass. I'd, I'd think it would be sucking down suns like it's nothing, especially when it's a billion times bigger than the sun. But apparently that's not the case. So it looks like the magnetic field in question, at least this one, has strong magnetic fields near its event horizon that are strong enough to push away some of the gas and dust and other material that's falling down into the black hole. And the researchers now speculate that this interaction, the fact that not all the material goes down into the black hole, some of it gets repelled by the magnetic fields, this could be the key to understanding these many thousands of light years long jets. And they even have images images of this here so you can see 
So some of these jets coming off of the black hole. So this is the black hole that we're looking at right here. And this is a blown out version. So this is the smaller, smaller, smaller. Uh, I mean, further away, further away, further away. So you can see that they're still using the same polarization method. There's still evidence of polarization inside of these jets that are being flung out from the black hole. So that's even that's even more evidence that the magnetic field is having something to do with it. Now, that's not the end of the question. That doesn't mean that magnetic fields are all there is um, to know about these galaxy-wide jets, but it is a new development in one of the coolest M images to ever exist. I mean, at least that's what they're saying. But I want to know what you have to say. The Horse Leafs Cabbage with the $50 donation says, Hey Kyle, uh, Floridian here. With the increased fidelity of photograph distant objects and the ability to simulate physical phenomena on a quantum to macro scale, it feels like we're on the cusp of a new era of astronomical studies. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the better the technology gets, the more able we're going to be able, the more able we will be to resolve distant, interesting objects. I think you're exactly right. Uh, Marvello Mavo with the 20 says, Neil deGrasse Tyson, nice, uh, just did an interview on Star Talk with Scott Kelly, the astronaut who had a twin here on Earth, and the scientist who studied him after he returned. It's something your fans might be interested in. All right, well, let's we can go check that out later. Cheech Ola, as always, with the Australian uh, $31, it says, G'day, Kyle. Who's your favorite Mass Effect character, and why is it Garrus Vakarian? Cheers, you legend. Um, I don't... I don't know. Garrus is close. I'm kind of a Liara guy. And... You can bet that we will be ram we will be romancing her when we do our playthroughs of Mass Effect with Jennifer Hale. Or maybe Jennifer gets to pick, I don't know, cuz she's Commander Shepard, right? Uh Breadboard, yeah 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 yeah, with the 20 says when we survey <laughs> when we survey in two holes, doc. I mean, Kyle. Why are you look at black holes but not me? Stephen Newman with the 10 says, "My wife heard your voice and asked if I was listening to Nerdy Thor. You could tell that from my voice?" How? I don't even... S of course I am. Of course I am. Lady, not enough science entertainers anymore. Oh, oh. Uh, Order of Anima with a 20 says, Repeat question to increase the simp love. Do you think neutrinis... <laughs> neutrinis will affect quantum computers in a similar or more... Will affect quantum computers in a similar or more dynamic way than our current technology, referring to that sonic glitch. Well, there's a, um, yeah, right now our, uh, our technology can be hit by particles incoming from space and it can flip a one to a zero or something like that. And I, I, I truly don't know what that will do to quantum computers, but I would guess that, well, right now I know that quantum computers and their so-called qubits or quantum bits are very fragile. They're very um, sensitive to measurement and to disturbance, and that breaks the wave, that collapses the wave function. You don't have a qubit anymore. So, excuse me. I, I I'm guessing that um, quantum computers are even more sensitive to disturbance. So that might be a problem, right? Uh, Grin Reaper of Trolls with a twenty says, "What happens if our supermassive black hole starts gobbling matter?" If our super, um, so matter falling into a black hole uh, releases a lot of energy, um, and these jets can shoot out in these directions. If uh, obviously, if these jets were to hit a planet or something like that, it would it would annihilate it. Um, but matter falling into a black hole itself is just creating heat and light. So if you're nowhere near it, it doesn't quite matter. But an interesting figure, you can do the calculations to see just how much heat and light matter. Um, gives up before it falls past the event horizon and theoretically the energy value is equal to 42 percent the mass energy of the object 42 <laughs> interesting computer says computer oi says hi handsome stop it uh angel near destruction says he skipped my donation entirely oh did i oh did i well too bad now <laughs> Uh, what? Why do people keep saying I, I keep skipping stuff? What? What do you want? Uh, 
second. Monker Z with... So needy. I'm only one boy. Monker Z with a five says, The cold fusion reactor on level 96 is getting a little spicy, if you know what I mean. Please send help. Kevin237 says, The lights look... Oh my god! <sighs> cold fusion react... 96. All right. Just a second. No, yeah. Yeah, it's me. You have caller... Uh, Monker Z says, Fusion Reactor level 96 getting a little spicy. Oh. Well, yeah, if, I mean, if you're still testing out the Sriracha Reactor, then go ahead. I know! You just put that much salt with that much spice and it just generates an exothermic react. He hung up on me. Uh, we have 20 from Chef. Says, hey Kyle, love the show. Thank you. Um, Spreading the birthday cheer and notifying all staff that subject 762B, codename the clever girl got loose, lunch tomorrow will be altered according a uh, feral beast. Don't think about that. Uh, with the 25, says, random thought I had. Solar power is based on our star, Sol. If we were to get, if we were to ever get power from a different star, would we call it solar power? Or would it be, or what would be a better name for it? Well, solar also applies to just stars in general, right? Um... Or does it? You know, I don't know. So if you had a different name for your son, would you call it like... Vectar Energy or something? Let the people who colonize a different solar system figure that out. You know, people like Elon Musk. Jeremy Humans with a 10 says, Hey Kyle, is there a magnet powerful enough to affect the iron in our blood? No. Is that what an MRI does? No. Is the iron in our blood not magnetic? It is. Also, do you bring social sciences to the public? Sometimes. Um, the amount, the field, the magnetic field strength you need to affect the iron in your blood, which is ferrous and can be affected by magnetic, field, magnetic fields, the, the field strength you would theoretically need is something we've never achieved in the lab. It's like an order of magnitude more than we've ever achieved in an MRI. And what an MRI does, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, you put a big magnetic field around a person so big that atoms in that person's body align with the magnetic field in a certain way. And when you do that, um, you can image those atoms by bouncing off different stuff from the person's body, more or less. But you're, 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 you're changing the orientation of stuff in a person's body at like the atomic level to get good images out of it. Um, Ewan Stark with a nine says, if a black hole has a 3D shadow because it's a sphere... And you can see all of its sides because it bends light. Is it technically a 4D object? Well, we're all kind of 4D objects. We are three-dimensional objects that travel through time. Yeah. Uh, but, no, I mean, it's an illusion. Like, the four-dimensionality that you're talking about with a black hole would be kind of an illusion. It's because light is falling into it. It doesn't mean that it's not existing in that third those three dimensions it's just that we're not seeing the reflection of it we have nick black with the 50 says longtime fan kyle you rock science thor keep it up i appreciate that nick black what a cool name you probably play guitar killer bo beep killer <laughs> killer bo peep with the 15 says hey kyle longtime lurker first time simper but I'm curious if the level of mind uploading to a computer would actually be you or it would just be an AI copy with all of your memories. Well, let me put it to you this way. What is your brain if not just a meat substrate with your memories in it? Or think about this for a second. I could, I could abstract you, every memory you have, Every regret, every love, every passion, every intent, every fear. I can map all of that through just a number of connections signaling to each other. Ones and zeros, more or less. Um, the mind is what the brain does. You are... Hmm, at, at the very base level who you are is a neuronal thunderstorm 
And once that storm calms down, you're gone. <laughs> I, got, I got a little weird. Scuba Dave with the 20 says, Hey, my name is Kyle Hill and I'm a super villain. Damn you, Dave! Don't take that. Also, what would happen if two equally sized black holes came into contact? What if, but what if one was fully antimatter? That thought woke me up. Um, I talked about this a little bit, but two th antimatter things connecting or, or uh, colliding might not be as bad as you think because <clears throat> they wouldn't, they'd have to be perfectly mixed to have uh, a full annihilation event, right? But in reality, if you had two anti uh, a sphere of matter and an antimatter sphere, the, the instant they touched, all of this would annihilate here and it would probably blow the spheres of material apart so you wouldn't get a perfect mixing and reaction. So um, it'd be like cracking two billiard balls of matter and antimatter together. <coughs> uh, Thomas Hadrick says, Legos or Connects? I'm a Lego. I'm a Lego boy. I had Connects, um, but they're so hard on my fingers. <laughs> Man, oh, just a pain in the... Michael Almeida with the Canadian 50 says, Simping for Science, great show, Kyle. To your knowledge, has anyone ever tried sending a photo to go into or around a black hole, or would it be a waste of resources? Oh, sending a probe, not photo. I was confused. Um, the, there's an information firewall. That's the problem, is that if you sent a probe like TARS and Interstellar into a black hole, there is n no way that we know of in the physical universe that it could send information back out or even escape back out. So it would be a, it, it would be a moot point. Um, Cheech Ola, again, with the Australian $31, says, G'day, Kyle. I watched Alien Covenant the other day. They had a rechargeable ship, a robot crew, and frozen embryo colonists. Is this a viable way of human expansion, or would it go pear-shaped like in the movie? Cheers, legend. Well, I mean, it is a real idea. You're talking more about, like, a, a generation ship. And let's pause the Super Chats for a second so we can get to crabs. <coughs> But what ships like that, with embryo colonists and um, suspended animation and robots and stuff like that, that's a real idea uh, called like a generation ship or a colony ship to get around the problem of distance. Um, space is so big that no one is going to explore it in just one human lifetime without something like warp drive or fusion drive. And that's even that's pushing it. So a generation ship or a starship or a hundred year ship is a theoretical way to have some living humans get to a place, even if it's thousands of years later. And so I think, it, I think it's quite plausible. Um, Nick Black with the 49 again, you get more, you get more money for being able to see through me on the internet. I'll hail the basilisk. I knew you played guitar. Now let's go <laughs> to our second topic, which is crab. These are soldier crabs. Soldier crabs have a interesting, too much, it's volumetrically, my hair is volumetrically challenged. These are soldier crabs. You may have seen soldier crabs, uh, a bunch of red swarming soldier crabs scurrying across roads and stuff like that in planet Earth. But soldier crabs come out by the millions and they move across surfaces and, and they forage and they spawn and all that stuff. But when they move around, an animal that moves in swarms like this can't move randomly. In fact, if all these creatures were moving in random directions, the swarm wouldn't get anywhere, would it? So what researchers have found is that these crabs don't move around randomly. In fact, at the edges of a crab swarm, there are so-called leaders, and they enforce the edge of the swarm... Uh, they enforce the edge of the swarm quite rigidly, such that... No one's going to get past. It's, it's forming a solid edge as they go. <coughs> and the crabs closer to the interior of the swarm just follow, just follow their neighbor. Again, with the hoarseness, what is that? So they just follow their neighbor. You can see this kind of behavior happening for something like a, 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 a mermation of starlings or a, um, a flock of birds or a flock of seagulls. Um, you can generalize the movement of flocks and swarms of animals by just a few simple rules like, oh, just go the direction your friend next to you is going, stop if they stop, that kind of thing. 
Now, why I'm mentioning all this is that the movement of these swarms of soldier crabs is so generalizable that you can make them do what you want. You can make little pathways for them to go down, and then you can scare them. <laughs> and what researchers have done with these crabs is, is put a shadow over them that looks like a bird, and they'll move away from the shadow. But then they'll move away in a very uh, predictable pattern. Like I said, leaders at the front, people following, that kind of thing. Now, why am I saying all this? Well, because researchers have been able to take these swarms of soldier crabs and make a logic gate out of it. And this is the most basic form of information processing. Logic gates are like, if then things, uh, if then uh, logical constructions that can be mapped onto something like a bit, like a one and a zero. So if, if this if this happens, it's a one. If that happens, it's a zero. If this and that happens, then it's a one. You know, those kind of things. So that's uh, logic gate is the fundamental idea and unit for information processing and for computation. It's the it's the basis of what computer chips are, for example. And researchers have, like I said, put these soldier crabs, because they move in such a specific way, they've put these soldier crabs in improvised logic gates and tested it in a geometrically constrained environment and showed them, uh, they put bird shadows over them and got them to move in a certain way and they were actually able to make logic gates. Now, why am I bringing all this up? Because I have a stupid calculation that I want to share with you. Because at the base level, information processing is just anything where you can get uh, one state or another state based on the events of, of the substrate, whether it be crab or silicone, silicon or, or what have you. So you can extract, you can, you can, anything that will behave in a certain way that you know, you could make a logic gate out of it, for example. And so these re researchers discovered that it takes about a swarm of 80 crabs to operate a single logic gate. Now, here comes the stupid calculation, because the, the 80 crabs move in a swarm that makes sense to them. The, the two uh, crab swarms, if they, for example, one crab swarm coming this way and one the other direction, when they meet in the center, they will combine and move in a specific way as a uh, byproduct of their relative velocities. They move kind of like billiard balls or something like that. 80 crabs to operate a single logic gate, which means... If there are eight logic gates in a byte, this means it would take about 640,000 soldier crabs to store enough information that is contained in a single tweet. And if we extend this out, we can imagine even more stupid things. Like, it would only take eight times that, <laughs> which is what? Eight times, four, almost five million, almost five million soldier crabs to create the computer that sent humans to Mars, uh, sent humans to the moon. And if you were a supervillain enough about it, you could take a bunch of crabs, you could take 16 billion, 39 million, 18 and a half thousand soldier crabs, and then you could run Doom. Now, I'm not saying that I am currently trying to grow an entire swarm of soldier crabs, a billion strong, such that I can run old PC games from 1993, but... I'm also not saying that I'm not, not doing that. But what do you have to say? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. That was kind of dumb. I thought it, I, it was more interesting to me in my head. Leave me alone. 
crystallized quantum sense, that just sounds like crab slavery with extra steps. They're moving in a swarm the way they want to. They're making food and they're doing things for themselves. I'm just, they're stepping on the little plates and they're getting me energy. So that's just... Uh, Miguel says, how does Hawking radiation work? Well, famously, Hawking radiation named after Stephen Hawking is a way that black holes would eventually lose mass and pop out of existence, disappear, evaporate, if you will. So you know that no material entering a black hole can escape, but what if there, and the, these are, uh, this is a known thing in particle physics, what if there was a pair of particles that was spontaneously generated, a particle and an antiparticle, but one of those particles was inside the event horizon, but the other one was outside. When they both disappear, then seemingly some mass has left the black hole, and it has to, to make this particle interaction um, work on either side of the event horizon. And so, over time, through processes like that, or that process, um, rather, black holes lose mass and emit radiation, and that's called Hawking radiation, or thereabouts. I'm not that smart. Order of Anima says, simping for my roommate, Joey Stash. Oh, with a 10. Keeping it simple, love the show. Just ask for the shout out, Science Thor. Well, Joey, oh! Monker Z says, alert, crab people have infiltrated level 96. Kevin237 fought them all. If I could get some Fs in the chat, that'd be fantastic. Andrew with the five says, Hey Kyle, what would it take to convince you to play D&D on stream? Maybe with another D&D YouTuber. Well, I think we, let's get, let's get the video game, science-y video game stuff under our belt first before we jump into a whole new thing that I've never done before. I'd probably play Magic on stream before I, I jumped into something like that. Uh... BT Dub says, hey Kyle, embrace crab or return to monkey. I think we should embrace crab. I'd love more legs. And I want to impress females with a giant pincer. Like a real big one that I could detach. But all the ladies would be like, whoa! Oh, wow. That thing's serious. <laughs> I can't read any comments because it's all just Fs. Uh, um, High Orc Wizard says, Hey Kyle, how many neutron stars would it take to destroy a black hole? Well, matter just falls into a black hole and the black hole will get more massive and it will radiate through Hawking radiation. Hey, look at us. Out over time. So you could throw as much mass into it as you wanted. It's the ultimate cosmic dumpster. <clears throat> Man. It's already rendered with the 20. It says, hey, Science Thor, I think you would be great in Critical Role. Fun fact, yes. <coughs> Me and uh, Matt uh, could have a hair off, and I would win. Because, I mean, come on. I could do that. Uh, Lucy Fox with the $10 says, I joined late, but want to simp for science. I love you, and I love your hair. No, you just love the idea of my hair. <laughs> uh, Amu Ross with the 10 is it possible for a black hole to get full? Yeah, see, I, I think I just kind of mentioned that, but I don't think so. I don't know. I, 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 that's, that's outside of the realm of my expertise. But do you know what it isn't? Peer review, baby. So on the last, uh, as we're wont to do here at the facility, each week we take a comment from the last episode and it makes it's a comment that makes me go, hey, oh wow. We highlight it, we mention how smart you are, and then you become an honorary member of the facility. Last week we talked about the Anatoly Burgoski incident. The only recorded instance of anyone ever having a body part interact with a particle beam inside of a particle accelerator. It's part of my Half-Life History series. If you enjoy that series... 
if you enjoy more true crimey mini documentary style videos narrated by yours truly, please check that out. Um, but on the uh, on the, on the, uh, uh, this comment. So today's peer review is for Travis Brown, who's quoting me when I say the particle beam missed critical brain areas in Anatoly's brain. That's probably why he didn't instantly die. Travis says, I'd like to consider all my brain areas critical. Thank you very much. Well, you say that. And something I didn't um, touch on on the video, in the video, but I wanted to, was Anatoly provides a good example for just how robust the human brain is. Um, the human brain is always changing. It's uh, making new connections, severing old ones, and it's incredibly resilient for what may possibly be the most complicated thing in the universe, literally, if no other life exists. He had a particle beam go through his brain, and he was, I mean, he had obviously effects, uh, you know, uh, developed epilepsy, lost hearing, facial paralysis, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't complete. He, he still finished his PhD afterwards. So a lot of him was still there. And it really highlights just how good the brain is at recovering from damage, being redundant. It's an, it's an incredible, incredible organ. And it harkens back uh, to the most famous man, probably, probably in all of psychology, Phineas Gage, who had a railroad spike shoot through his head from the bottom to the top and it was one of the most famous examples in all of neurology because it provided direct evidence that the makeup of your brain determines who you are as a person and your personality before he had a railroad spike go through his face he was a family man he was loving and caring afterwards he started drinking and gambling and going to brothels and he was terrible to his wife and his kids. So it totally changed him. And it was direct evidence that those two things were linked, which we didn't have before. So similarly that, that, and, but he, he had a railroad spike through his head and he didn't instantly die. It just changed who he was. So examples like this show that the brain is even more amazing than you think that when, when you miss critical brain areas, Yes, all parts of your brain are important, but when damaged, even these um, this amazing organ can still shore up enough resources for you to still be a person. I mean, you can remove half of a person's brain and they can be fine. Not fine, fine, of course, you're missing half of your brain, but you're not, you don't instantly die and you don't forget what the concept of numbers is, you know. So, Travis, for helping me point that out. The brain is more amazing than you think it is just because of how much damage it can take while retaining your personhood. You are now an honorary member of the facility, and Kevin's going to get you a plaque. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Wait, what? That's... Do you want a... Do you want a magic card that's the blackest black... There is Kevin. This Kevin. This is not a plaque. It's it's black. I said plaque. Maui Goomba says, what a loser. I only have two brain cells. That's not true. Uh, 1224 Chris says, is Kevin a real person? How dare you? Would you say that to a person? Uh, 
uh, I couldn't think of a name, says, Hey Kyle, do you think that humans can make a zombie virus by using the different fungi that causes the same symptoms of the animal in animals to affect humans? I think having a zombie virus for people is, is very, very plausible. It would be harder to, to figure out that we're, we were truly being taken over because, you know, human behavior is very, very complex. But we get hints every so often that there are parasites that do that kind of thing. Toxoplasmosis, which uh, reproduces in cats, and you can get it from just being around cats and their litter boxes. It has been linked correlationally, not causationally, to suicide and schizophrenia and these kind of things. So, you know, someone with schiz if if you develop schizophrenia, that has an enormous impact on your life, and you could be being controlled by it in a certain way. And so I think that's very plausible. And parasitism is the most common form of life, life strategy on the planet. So I think it's, yeah, it's very plausible. Can we create it? I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not going to tell them about it. That'd be way too obvious. Probably not. We probably can't do it. I'm not, I'm definitely not doing it. Mark Swamp says hair in the bum, in the bun now. No, I, it's so thick. It gets really hot. Okay. And I even have like five fans on me. See, look, look, there's a fan directly on my neck. Watch. Look, it's spewing out. Watch this. What? <laughs> what? What? Watch. See? It's... Huh, I was pretty sure. Do you turn off the air conditioning too? You ass? Zay Mac with the ten dollars who says, "Kyle, you inspired me to take better care of my hair. Genetically, my hair is curly. Anyway, just chipping in, simping for science. Yeah, if your hair is curly, you need a lot. You need to maintain quite a bit. Mine's a little wavy, mostly straight. So, yeah, take your hair. That's that's one thing that guys don't do. If you're if you're a guy, um, but it seems to me like guys uh, don't value their their hair very much, and they don't do the things that it's been shown. I mean." Obviously, it would make, you know, expensive shampoo and conditioner and, and uh, you know, blow drying it and putting stuff in it like product and argan oil. Uh, take care of your hair and then you won't look like you're a <laughs> take care of your hair. So you don't look like you're in the battle of the bands in 2001. And if you feel called out by that, you should do something about it. Oh, did it finally did you did they turn it back on? Good. Uh, Elizabeth Calvert says we already have a zombie virus. It's called rabies. Good point. I mean, it's not it's not close to what you see in you know twenty eight days later. Well, it is. No, it is pretty close. I mean, it makes mammals aggressive. It makes you bite against your will. And let me uh, let me throw this at you. Why do you think you sneeze and you cough when you have a cold? You can't cough out the virus. It's not like it's stuck in your throat. So what are you doing? Well, it's the virus intentionally. Well, it doesn't have, it's not thinking, but evolutionarily it's a strategy. It's the virus through an evolved behavior irritating your mucous membrane such that you can cough and sneeze more often so you can spread it more so. So even with something as simple as a cold, are you as free as you think you are? No. <laughs> Man, ever, the last three weeks, I'm just like after 30 minutes of speaking, my voice is beginning really hoarse, like bad hoarse. Like it's never been this bad. <laughs> oh, man. Grin Reaper of Troll says, how do you grow your hair out? Mine is in my eyes and I can't stand it. Well, um, you just don't cut it. But more seriously, I know you're probably going through the, the weird phase where it, if you let it get longer, it's in that middle phase where it looks bad and you don't want anyone to see it. What I did is I wore hats for a long time <laughs> until it got long enough to be cool. Mr. Dinglet says, is zombific a word? No. Just a raptor right in America. Just a raptor riding American with a chainsaw says, 
So Cal, what do you think about using black holes to generate energy? Do you think a black hole generates some amount of antimatter via conservation of mass? Well, you, you full-blooded American. No, there are theories about using, there, there are ideas about using a black hole to generate energy. They're called black hole engines. And what they do is they use a very, very tiny black hole and they put a, uh, some sort of capture sphere around it that would be able to capture the heat and then generate steam and make electricity or, or whatever it is. But you're capturing the energy given off by a black hole because the energy given off via Hawking radiation goes up exponentially the smaller the black hole is. When a black hole is super massive, like M87, like we were talking about earlier, it could take trillions of years for it to go all the way down. But if it's really, really tiny, microscopic, nanoscopic, could be in minutes, hours, seconds. So if you had a, the perfect size black hole, you could get oodles of energy out of it while feeding material to it and capturing that radiated energy uh, in the form of Hawking radiation, using that um, to drive your starship. And that's a real idea. Look up a black hole starship or black hole engine and uh, you'll see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Chip Tech with the five says, hey, I tried asking you this earlier. You said that a railroad spike went through Phineas Gage's head and he didn't die. Could you argue that the spike killed who he was? Sure. But you're, you're never one static thing, right? I'd argue that Phineas Gage after the accident is still him. I, I'm... What, I, what I'm getting at is that I don't like pinpointing one set of attributes, one set of thoughts, beliefs, actions, intuitions, intentions. I don't like pinning those that make you who you think you are to one point in time. You're, you're a constantly evolving organism, right? We change, we learn, um, we reflect. So, yeah, it could kill... It, the the railroad Spike, I suppose, killed who people thought he was and who his family thought he was, but he was still him. You're always you. No matter who that who is. Uh, Vate7 says, with a five, says, hey, show Kyle the love. Curious, if you've read The Seven Eves and what you think on something like The Swarm for surviving in low Earth orbit. I know, actually, that's on my list. I have not read it, but I, um, when I was looking up good hard sci-fi um, novels, that came up, and I, I know I do have to read that. Metal Kitty meow, says, Kyle, hey, show the love. You're going to be the death of me. You ought to know that you have been keeping me sane in a world of misinformation, and I have given up 90% of social media. Hey, happy to be of service uh, any way that I can in a very confusing and uh, deeply troubled information ecosystem. I... I, I came really close last week to deleting all of my social media presence. But, you know, I can probably do more good than harm if I'm, if I'm cognizant and I try to get information out there or at least talk about things um, like we do. So I decided against it. But I came pretty close. Because, see, people don't tell you this. Unless you're in the biz. But the click-through rate on stuff like uh, tweets and Instagram posts, um, even like uh, YouTube end cards and stuff like that, is usually 0.1% to 1%. So think about that. You get 100,000 views, you might get 1,000 actual clicks on a link. Or 100. Right? So what am I saying? Oh, so so when you, when you put so, so much effort into, con like, putting links out there and, and showing, trying to show everyone every facet of your life and, and promoting stuff and blah, 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 blah. It looks like it's doing something, but it doesn't really actually do something. The majority of traffic at the facility comes from the homepage and browse features. It's not even notifications. It's not even people clicking that bell. That's like less than 15%. And the traffic you get from social media is less than 1%, less than 2%. It's almost meaningless. It's almost like we're all just in this grotesque circle of, 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 of 
of celebrating each other's construction, uh, false constructions of each other for short bursts of serotonin that we don't, that we're, that we're already, uh, 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 we already have the tolerance for, and we need more and 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 more. What was I talking about? Gustavo, the five says, Hey show, love the Kyle. Dang it. In Mobile Suit Gundam show, a terrorist drops a space base that is as big as a whole country on Earth. How bad would this be? You drop something the size of a country on Earth from orbit when it's traveling a few kilometers per second and it will wipe out all life on Earth. Easy. Uh, a, a, uh, an asteroid going 10 to 20, 50 kilometers per second or whatever only has to be like 2 miles, 10 miles 50 miles across to cause a, cla a cataclysmic civilization ending event. So something that's 3,000 miles across, like the United States, in the form of an asteroid or a comet or whatever, um, smacking into Earth at orbital velocities would obliterate the planet. Well, the planet might be there, it might knock off a chunk of it, it might form another Mars or something like that, but everybody on, on the surface of the planet would be dead. The Borgman says, do you think future power requires us to work on new technologies to change thermal energy to electric? Labs are at like 9%, talking direct. Thermal energy directly to electric energy. Well, I'm not really caught up on that. Um, I didn't know the efficiency was so bad. But um, yeah, there's, um, there's theoretical efficiencies for everything. Nothing is ever going to be 100% efficient when you're converting one form of energy to another. That's it's because of entropy. Entropy's all, uh, entropy's a thing. It rules the universe. Um, that's why uh, perpetual motion devices and free energy devices are impossible, physically impossible, um, because you're always going to lose something in the form of heat um, and deformation, and sound, and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, working on efficiency is going to be one of those game changers to make our, ener uh, our energy generation better. However, that is very hard to do. You know, we, we, we've been working on these things for decades. It's, it's unlikely that someone's going to have a giant breakthrough that's going to change everything. So that's why people like me advocate for stuff like nuclear energy, because we have it now. It's way more energy dense. It's way safer. And um, that would go towards alleviating a lot of the problems that we're facing without needing some huge technological breakthrough first. Right. Uh, just a couple more here, because my voice is gone again. For some, Am I screaming in the middle of the night? Am I having night ta terrors about cobras? I do have a lot of nightmares. I'm usually being ripped apart by dogs. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's not fun. Sergeant Sphinx with the 20 says, Hey Kyle, black hole talk reminded me of something. Just is a paired rocket flies cl a paired rocket flies close to the event horizon is one, and one is dropped into a black hole and the other gains energy. Seems odd to me, but I don't know enough to be sure. It depends on what you mean by paired. If they're connected by a rope, the rope's going to snap or it's going to pull both in. It depends. I, I, I can't answer. It depends on what you mean by paired. Um, Spasmodius 6. Weren't you 5 before? With the 5. Says, Kyle, hi, just here to simp. Just here to simp everyone else is dead. Oh, wait, wait. Everyone else is dead. Robo-gators are holding me hostage. We never... We never stood a chance. Thanks for being a worthy adversary. That's right. That's why you don't mess with the administrator in his own facility. That's like stepping on a court with Michael Jordan. Before he had the Hitler mustache for no reason. <laughs> Remember when he did that? Why didn't anyone tell him? Excuse me, sir. Uh... You're doing a Hanes commercial, and you... did you forget to? Oh, it's a thing you're trying. Okay. You know who this guy is, right? He's uh, did a lot of bad stuff. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going off the rails now. This isn't very sciencey. It's fine. Uh, Henry Zink says, hey, Kyle, showing love. I have a question. In the future, if we colonize Mars and start mining materials on the red planet and transferring them to Earth. 
we change the orbital paths of Earth and Mars? I get this question a lot, where how much stuff would you need to move on? And let's uh, stop the Super Chat so we can get to uh, the end of the stuff. Um, but uh, people ask me this a lot. How much mass or how much would you have to do to a planet to change how it orbits or its gravitation or something like that? So much. So much. The amount I would I'd be willing to wager... I'd have to do the math on this. But the amount of mass that humans have ever shot off into space, all the rockets, all the rocket fuel, all the people, all the machines, all the satellites, all everything, has had such a small effect on anything to do gravitationally with the Earth that we have nothing that's good enough to measure how small that effect has been. I say that to say this. The am <laughs> You would have to do something radical to each planet to affect the way that it moves throughout the solar system. And we just do not have that kind of technology. I mean, you see how few rockets we actually launch. So, if we do colonize Mars, no. I, I don't think... I think we'll probably bring material to the planet rather than exporting it because we want to bring, you know, minerals from asteroids and water and gas and air and all this stuff. But... You know, in in doing this already on Earth for a hundred years or fifty years, sixty years now, the mass that we've moved is negligible. And with that, I just <laughs> my voice, my beautiful voice. And with that, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for stopping by the facility and prying your way into my blast doors this week. Um, this week at the facility. Uh, I'm going to try, because there's some interesting physics involved, I'm going to try, right after this stream, I'm going to try to quickly film a short video about the physics, the hydrodynamics of uh, a giant ship like the Ever Given in a restricted waterway like the Suez Canal. There's actually some fluid mechanics, fluid dynamics, that goes into how this could have happened and block global trade for six days. So I'm going to do a quick video on that, hopefully get that out to you by the end of the week. Um, and we're drawing ever closer to our video game streams that we're going to do. And if you want to talk to me all about that, after this stream is done, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and sign up for the facility today. Drape a silky white lab coat and moon shirt on your body. Talk to me in Discord, where I'm always lurking 24-7, pretty much. Get behind-the-scene photos, you get videos earlier, you get members-only live streams with me. <laughs> Not like that. So you can go there, do that. That's nice. Thank you to my security team, as always, for being so fast and manhandly with the chat. I love that. Have a wonderful rest of your week. I will see you next week live at the facility. And until then, be nice to each other because this is all we got. Yeah. No, I just stopped the stream. Yeah. Well, I think, if anything, I would go with the spinal crabs. Yeah, they, they pinch the little nerves, and they make it really hard to do acrobatics. It's not that specific. I have something against the Olympics. Because that sounds like a villainy 